Number one there, let's go. <clears throat> Christ's second coming will be the climax of human history as we have known it. In other words, it will never be the same. Uh, when Christ returns and defeats the enemy, from that time on, this world will never be the same like it is today. It'll be better, okay? Christ's coming will be VI, visible. You remember Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, it says, and every eye shall see him, right? Literal, L-I-T, literal, physical. And the reason I emphasize those is because a lot of times they try to do away with Israel completely, replacement theology and things like that, so they try to spiritualize these things. So that's why I say physical, literally, visible, so that we don't spiritualize it, okay? And uh, is referred to 1,845 times in the Bible. <laughs> That's his second coming. Isn't that amazing? I read that and I said, whoa. 1,845. That's one with a comma, A, four, five. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> okay. Christ's second coming is A is to conquer, C-O-N, conquer, and to defeat the Antichrist with his armies. And when does he defeat him, by the way? We just went over that Sunday morning. Armageddon. He defeats him at Armageddon. When is Armageddon? The last battle at the end of the tribulation. Okay, right at the end of the tribulation. Notice... Uh, B, it is together and to, R-E, restore believing Israel. And I just wrote above my believing one-third. One-third of Israel will be the remnant, okay? She will get her kingdom as Christ promised. See, I called Israel her, Carol. Did you see that? <laughs> we had discussion at supper. Or... Anyway, notice where it's underlined shall assemble the outcast of Israel, gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Uh, notice it says Israel and Judah. Why is that? Two different. Ten, Israel refers to the ten northern tribes and Judah the two southern tribes. Okay? And then where it's underlined in Matthew 24, verse 31, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect, talking of Israel, the believing ones, from the four winds and from one end of heaven to the other. C, the reason he's coming, it is to judge, J-U-D, judge the living. God will assemble all living Jews and Gentiles to D-E, determine who of them get to go into the kingdom. This will be the judgment of the sheep and goats. That's in uh, Matthew 25. That's after Christ has come, defeated the enemy. He calls the sheep and the goats before him. And he s takes away the goats. And he allows the sheep to go into the kingdom. Okay? D, it is to resurrect the believing dead. They will be the resurrection this will be the resurrection of the Old Testament, OT, Old Testament believers, like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all of them, and MAR, martyred tribulation believers, who are to reign with Christ in his kingdom. You know, we've talked forever the last few years because we try to start rightly dividing, and uh, we tried to explain the kingdom over and over and over. Because once you get the kingdom and you get that down straight in your thinking, it helps you to understand what a mystery and secret the body of Christ truly is, if you can get that down. And so we emphasize the kingdom. Once you understand about Israel, then you can understand better about the body of Christ, which we're in today. Okay? C, uh, e, it is to bind, B-I-N-D, bind the devil for the duration of the kingdom. Uh, Stan, you got 1 John 3, 8? 1 John 3, 8. 
He that committed the living. For this purpose, in the middle, for this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy, what? The works of the devil. Okay? So then on your syllabus, it is to bind the devil for the duration of the kingdom. Satan will be in prison in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. Now, what's the interesting thing about him going to the bottomless, bottomless pit? Huh? He's alone. That's right. Who, who were his comrades? The Antichrist, false prophet. Where are they? The lake of fire. Once you go in the lake of fire, you never get out. So Satan has to be loose a little bit, doesn't he? So he doesn't go to the lake of fire. He goes to the bottomless pit that's in hell right now. There's a section in hell that's called the bottomless pit, the abyss. Okay, that's where the devil goes at this time. If it is to establish himself as king of kings and lord of lords, he will sit on his throne, T-H-R-O, throne to reign over the earth. We wish he were here today. <laughs> All that stuff in Ukraine wouldn't be going on, would it? Yeah. Yeah, it's sad what's going on there, isn't it? Just breaks your heart. You say, how long does it take to send stinger missiles and anti-tank things? Get it in there. What's the problem here? Isn't that amazing? They will fight themselves, and uh, they need the equipment. Uh, Kenny and I were talking about supper there have been even American and British volunteers going in, and they're on the ground there fighting with the Ukrainians right now. And, uh, yeah, so we hope that they prevail, that's for sure. Okay, number three, Armageddon, that Christ just won, we went through that, is actually a war campaign, C-A-M, campaign, involving a S-E-R series of battles in the land of Israel. It is the climatic event in the tribulation period. This is when all the armies of the earth go against Israel. And when Jerusalem is captured, Jesus Christ returns to destroy the Antichrist invading armies and to deliver the faithful believing Jewish remnant. And... Uh, Sometimes we think he just comes, fights Armageddon. No, uh, he goes to, we'll mention here, just three specific places. He goes, even before he goes to the, the Mount of Olives and fulfills that prophecy. Uh, yeah, so sometimes in our thinking we just say, well, Armageddon. Well, there's some important battles that take place, and we'll, we'll see that in just a second. Armageddon. Armageddon's location will spread over the Ian, entire land of Israel, and then some. It will go from Megiddo in the north to Edom, Basra in the south. The Bible mainly focuses on three specific places where the battles will be the most Ian intense. The first one is the Valley of Jehosh Jehoshaphat. This is probably the Kindred Valley on the east, E-A-S-T, east side of Jerusalem. It runs between the eastern wall and the Mount of Olives. Uh, I've been there. I've been up on the Mount of Olives. And as you look down, you see there uh, the Kidron Valley. And then you see the eastern gate that's sealed up right now. So from Mount of Olives, you see the Kidron Valley right up to the eastern gate. Yeah, it's, it's really, it's, it's exciting when you see, you're up there and you see that. And then the second place is the valley of, however you want to say that. How do you say it? Estralon. Is that good enough? Okay. Uh, it is also known as the valley of Jezreel, the valley of Tanakh, and the plains of M.E.G., Megiddo, and remember I've talked about that, how huge that is. It is here the armies meet in alliance with Antichrist 
and will meet with their doom. The other specific place is Basra, Edom. And those are the verses you can look at sometime. Basra is a city east of the Jordan River. Edom is modern Jordan, J-O, Jordan. So you were talking about Edom last week, Earl. Uh -huh. It's actually Jordan, and that's something. Christ will lead his army down to Edom to rescue the HID hiding remnant there. There will be a great slaughter, so much so that the land will flow with blood staining, uh, blood staining Christ's clothes. Remember Basra and Petra, P-E-T-R-A, Petra. Petra are close to the same area, and that's going to be the area where the remnant is supernaturally protected by God. It's called a wilderness also, by the way. But it's, uh, uh, Satan tries to get to him a couple times. And, uh, but God protects him. Two, Herman A. Hoyt describes Armageddon and its scope. The phenom phenomenal aspect will gather about the Battle of Armageddon with which the tribulation period will come to a close. The staggering dimensions of this conflict can scarcely be conceived by man. The battlefield will stretch from the ghetto on the north to Edom on the south, a distance of 1,600 furlongs approximating 200 miles, and it will reach from the Mediterranean Sea on the west to the hills of Moab on the east, a distance of almost 100 miles. So you have 200 miles long and 100 miles wide. It will include the valley of Jeho Jehoshaphat and the plains of Estrelon. And the center of the entire area will be the city of Jerusalem. Into this area, the multiplied millions of men, doubtless, uh, uh, doubtless they're, uh, I'm sorry, approaching 400 million, will be crowded for crowded for the final holocaust of humanity. The kings with their armies will come from the north and the south, from the east and from the west. There will be an invasion from hell beneath spirits, and entering the scene at the last moment will be an invasion from outer space, Christ with his angels. In a most dramatic sense, this will be the valley of decision for humanity and the great winepress into which will be poured the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. <laughs> I thought he explained that well. And uh, it's going to be something. We have learned the Antichrist and false prophet are cast into the lake of fire. But Satan is sealed in the A-B-Y abyss, the bottomless pit for a thousand years. The king's armies are slain at Armageddon, making Christ and his armies victorious. And there shouldn't have been any question about that anyway. You know that? <laughs> we know he's going to be victorious, don't we? Uh, never have to worry about that. Then John says, And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The first part of that verse, And I saw thrones, and they that sit upon them, and judgment was given unto them. Here we have the setting of a tribunal to judge or to vindicate those who shall have part in the first resurrection now just remember the first resurrection is really important okay you'll see in just a minute the right to exercise judgment is given to certain ones who are those on these thrones well first of all Christ remember 
For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. So if anybody else does that, it's because Christ gives them the authority to do that, but he's the head man, okay? He's the authority. And then there's the apostles. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that you which have followed me in the regeneration, or the kingdom, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye shall also sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So you have Christ judging, you have the twelve apostles judging the twelve tribes of Israel, and then some saints. Daniel said, And I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints, and prevailed against them, until the Ancient of Days. Who's that? That's Christ, came. And judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came and so on. So this will be the judgment connected with the first resurrection, D-E, deciding those who get to go into the kingdom. You all with me so far? Okay. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast and so on. A, this is referring to the martyrs of mainly Revelation 6, 9 through 11. You remember that? We saw under the altar the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Christ and so on. Right? You remember they're up there saying, how long? How long is it going to take you before you avenge our deaths? We stood up for you. Now, when are you going to stand up for us, in a sense? Okay? That's who these are. These martyred saints will enjoy their resurrection, along with many others, to receive V-I-N, vindication, on those who had shed their blood. Now, the next paraphrase is interesting. Although there will be many Old Testament saints who are resurrected, now, just think about that for a second. The Old Testament saints are going to be resurrected here, and uh, just think of all those that you've read about in the Bible. All the leaders, the prophets, the uh, many, many people that are the stories of the Bible. And here they are, they come back to life. And uh, it's going to be something. I'd be able to see that, isn't it? Uh, it's, just, it's unimaginable. It states, God will honor them all, Hebrews 11. Have you ever read Hebrews 11? I think it's verse 35 and following, I think. And about all those saints, Isaiah was sawed in, in half <laughs> and asunder, it says. And uh, a lot of those saints gave their lives, lived in caves, ran and hide and hid from uh, the forces in the day in which they lived, but they kept the faith. They're heroes of faith. They will be there one day, too. They all, A-L-L, -L, will be part of this first resurrection. These tribulation-believing martyrs who are beheaded for their faith will receive SPEC special mention and honor. And they reign with Christ a thousand years. The point here is they lived again and by the way, not their soul. Their soul always lived. It's just been living in a place called paradise, right? And so we're talking about their bodies coming to life again, okay? To physically come to life again. Their soul, their soul spirit, which had been in heaven, is reunited with their body B-O-D-Y, body on earth again, to live N-O-R, normal physical lives. That's amazing. Probably also they will live a lot longer during the thousand-year reign. I don't know if they're going to die or not. Now, some that are rebellious will die by the hand of judgment, but... Uh, They will supernaturally, like they did in the Old Testament, they used to live a lot longer, didn't they? They won't have to worry about climate change. 
during the thousand year reign. Amen? <laughs> and uh, it's going to be something special for him. This will be a fulfillment Christ promise. He said in John 11, Jesus said unto her, Lazarus' sister, Mary, I guess, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And so he fulfills that promise here. John is the first. Now this is good. John is the first here in Revelation to tell us the D-U-R-A, duration of the kingdom on earth is a thousand years. He's the first one. They've talked about the kingdom over and over and over, and it's John, not until John is it revealed that it's a thousand years long, this one on earth here, okay? This means it is a literal kingdom, and John mentions its length no less than six times in Revelation. When mentioning the 12 apostles on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes, we need to remember that on earth, Jerusalem will be the throne, T-H-R-O-N-E, the throne, and all nations will come to it. Jeremiah 3.17, at that time they shall call Jerusalem, what? The throne of the Lord. And then it goes on to state that, I think that's good, and all the nations shall be gathered unto it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. Why won't they walk or do or act according to the imaginations of their evil heart during the thousand-year reign. Deb? He does the believing Jews, okay, and Gentiles who believe. But these will be those that are born during the, the thousand-year reign, okay? The heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. They still have the seed of Adam in them. But there is a deterrent that keeps them from acting out what they think. And what is that deterrent? It's Christ, the rod. Instant rebuke of them. Yeah. It's like when you were at school in the old days, if you acted up, your teacher that had that flab hanging down from their arm come up and bop you. Anybody have a teacher like that beside me? <laughs> oh, boy. And by the way, her name was Mrs. Grimm. <laughs> uh, yeah. She could be grim at times. <laughs> okay. D. Christ long awaited, A W A I T, awaited kingdom reign in Israel. Jerusalem has arrived. And I'll just look at a couple of these. Luke 1 Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, Mary, and bring forth a son, Jesus shall call his name Jesus, and he shall be great, and he shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Then Zechariah 14, 9, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. Isaiah 9, 7, Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it. And he's going to be on that throne. Verse 5, but the rest of the dead lived not until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. This refers to all of lost, L-O-S-T, lost mankind throughout earth's existence who have no part in the blessed first resurrection. That makes sense? I kind of messed up with this next little phrase. I, should, I wanted to say something else, but it... All non-believers, okay? The souls of the lost of the ages will remain in the heart of the earth in torment until the end of the thousand years. They then will be raised only, 
O-N-L-Y, to face the great white throne judgment and then cast into the lake of fire. That doesn't sound very good, does it? <laughs> All lost people of the past and that will be in the future, they go to the heart of the earth in a place called Hades or hell, okay? And uh, many have been there for many, many years already. And uh, it's not until after the thousand-year reign will they be raised up. And not to something good, but only to be thrown into something more terrible called the lake of fire, lake of fire. Yeah, and I've said before, that's like going down uh, Marion County Jail or Johnson County Jail, and uh, you've been sentenced, but uh, later on you're taken out of there, then you're sent, sent to federal prison. And uh, you left the county jail for the federal prison. Well, that's in a sense, they leave the center of the earth place of torment, and then they're taken to their federal prison for all eternity in the lake of fire. This passage also shows that there are two, there are two resurrections separated by a thousand years. The first resurrection is for all the saved, S-A-V, the saved of the Old Testament, Gospels, Early Acts, and Tribulation believers. Now, don't miss this next point. Remember, our resurrection, rapture, has A-L already happened. It was secret in the sense, and ours is not a part of the first resurrection. Israel and those who followed Israel, the believers, they're part of the first resurrection. We're not in the body of Christ we're not part of this resurrection at the end, or uh, I'm sorry, just as the thousand years begin. That's when they're raised up right here. Uh, we're not part of that. Uh, the body of Christ is separate from Israel. And we go up and we're transitioned to new bodies. And uh, so just remember that in your thinking, Okay. So this is talking about Israel, the first resurrection, right? At times, now this is good for you as you learn the Bible. At times, the first and second resurrection are mentioned, T-O, together in prophecy without reference to the period of time, thousand years, that separates these two great resurrections. And let me just say, that's why there are a number of people uh, who believe in a general resurrection. You know, we're all raised up at the same time. The good go to heaven or stay on earth, and the bad go to hell. They call that a general resurrection. And there's a lot of believers that believe that. And uh, I've had people in my family even that kind of, just when they read that, that's, that's what they think, okay? That there's going to be one general resurrection, and, you know, if you've been good, you go to heaven. If you've been bad, you go to hell. <laughs> A general resurrection. But notice John 8 here. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. For they, uh, I'm sorry, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Now look at that where it says that last line, life and they that have done it. There's a thousand years gap right there. Right there. There's a thousand year gap. Okay? Daniel chapter 12, notice verse 2. 
Daniel 12, 2. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. See there it says to everlasting life? Thousand years. And some to shame and everlasting contempt. You know, it's just like uh, I've, I've given the verse many times. I, th- I thought I was using it. I do on a, another page. It talks about unto us a child is born, Christ. Unto us a son is given, the cross. Sons on the cross, right? And the government, thousand years right there. The government's never been on his shoulder yet. But it will, we're reading that, when he returns at the end of the tribulation. Then the government will be on his shoulder. So there's a gap of time in between in those verses there. And so that's just where you read your Bible, and as you study and as you learn, you begin to see some of those things. And they're exciting when the lights come on and you see that, okay? A lot of you, the light's out right now. You're just looking at me funny. <laughs> but it, it, it's fun. What's the greatest truth you learned? What, what made the lights come on in a certain area to you? Rightly dividing. That's when lights come on several ways, doesn't it? What's something else that came to you that the lights came on? When you got saved? That was exciting, wasn't it? It, it, The lights came on. Paul and the Twelve are different. They're saying the same, different things, aren't they? Twelve had their gospel. Paul had his, didn't he? The lights come on. You say, whoa, something's different about this, isn't it? Yes. No, go on. It is a moment, isn't it? Did you start to say something? Okay. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Lights came on, huh? You know, when I was rightly dividing, I was beginning learning. The reason I'm hesitating right now, I don't have much to go here, okay? So anyway, <laughs> so I remember when I, I was studying rightly divided, I was getting with it and everything, and I was still at Emmanuel my last year as a Baptist, and uh, these things started coming to me, and, and I saw where it was going. I knew it was going to baptism. <laughs> I knew I would be there before it was over, but I had to get that in my own mind and my own thinking before I could ever go there, you know. So it's been, but when the lights come on about something, it's exciting, isn't it, okay? And when you learn like these gap times and you're studying that, so well, that hadn't happened yet. So it hadn't happened yet, and so that's been over 2,000 years, <laughs> you know. So there's a gap there, isn't it? Yeah. Larry, you start to say something? Yes, sir. Well, June said you were stubborn. <laughs> I'm kidding. So you didn't see the gaps? No, you just see new things. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and, uh, that's what that's yeah, it's exciting when it finally clicks. I mean, if you want to know what the Bible actually says, okay? And we're still, you never come to age. It seems like you're always learning in it, don't you? I don't care who you are. Okay, verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. 
only saved people. On such the second death, second resurrection, the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. The first resurrection promised the second death shall have no power to touch, T-O-U-C-H, to touch a resurrected believer. Amen? So what's he saying to the Jews here? If you're part of the first resurrection, that second resurrection and the death, you'll never have a part in it, and it can't touch you. You're safe, you're secure in me. And then I give you two verses. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the, what? Second, Second death. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit uh, saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. So if you're part of this first resurrection, right here before the thousand years, and you get to go into it, the second one that will be at the white throne judgment, we'll see next week, but it can't ever touch you. So they had security once that took place. Number two, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. The believer in the prophetic program, Israel's, receiving the resurrection of life, then going into the kingdom was the H-O-P-E, hope of the Israeli. Also, and by the way, it was. You remember, even after his resurrection in Acts 1-6, they said, Lord, will you at this time restore to Israel the kingdom? <laughs> they were always looking, and even during his life ministry, they thought it would immediately happen because Christ was there. Okay? That, that's their hope. Also, being a, in a nation of priests has long been the Jews' hope and fulfillment. Understand, the only way they could have an intimate relationship with God was to go through, T-H-R-O, a priest. They had to take their sacrifices to a priest, Levi's. They had to annually go for the high priest to go represent them, right? But in the kingdom, that is over. They will then be able to go, D-I-R, directly themselves to the Lord, being priests themselves. <laughs> you know, I was thinking about this. A lot of times we've always used, we kid flow a lot. Uh, in my father's house are many mansions. And she said, I want my mansion. <laughs> and I said, well, that's to the Jews. That's not to you. <laughs> and she gets mad about it. But, uh, but some of our songs give the mansion back. So we're, we're like a country song. We go back and forth on that. And uh, <laughs> isn't that true, a country song, right? And uh, they say, if you get divorced and you lose your truck and you lose your house and you lose your money, just play the record back and you get it all back. <laughs> and so... So anyway, these here, uh, he said, uh, that where I am, there you may be with me. And it has the idea that the Israelites, these 12, they will be in the throne area, in a sense, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. They will be with him somewhere there in Jerusalem. So it's going to be interesting. Uh, but the prophecy, Exodus 19 Look at verse 6. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So Moses prophesied this is what it will be like one day. Okay? They forfeited it, but the promise still stayed for those who would believe in Christ one day. Exodus chapter 20. And this is the thing that thou shalt do unto them, to hollow them, priest, to minister unto me in the priest's office. Take one young bullock and two rams without blemish, and Aaron and his sons thou shalt bring into the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and shall wash, 
shall baptize them ceremonially with water. Then shall thou take the anointing oil and pour it upon his head and anoint him. I think that's interesting. Uh, the Holy Spirit is kind of an, an anointing. They were to be water baptized, and they waited for the anointing or the power of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. The Jews did, didn't they? Okay. Why did John come baptizing, washing? Why did the disciples wait for Pentecost? They were, P-R-E, preparing for the priesthood as the kingdom was ready to be offered in early Acts. So baptism had a very significant role in the people of Israel. Okay? They were becoming a kingdom of priests. In this millennium, this thousand-year reign, Israel will be a kingdom of priests. You get that? Okay, no, look at verse Isaiah. But ye shall be named the priest of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. That's what they're going to be one day. Israel. First Peter, you've heard that, those terms used before. First Peter, he says this in verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal what? Well, who's Peter speaking to, by the way? Those scattered Jews, isn't he? Huh? A holy nation. Is the body of Christ a holy nation? Of course not. Revelation 1, 6, And hath made us, Jews, kings and priests unto God and his Father. Revelation 5, 10, And hath made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Who's that speaking of? Israel, the Jews. And then also here in verse 6. Now, D, don't you find it odd and amazing that Paul, our apostle, never, N-E-V-E-R, never mentions us as priests in all his writings? Isn't that interesting? You know, as a Baptist, we always talk about we're part of the priesthood of God. Didn't we? Yeah, Earl. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? But I know Baptists, that was one of their fundamental doctrinal faith statements, that we were part of the priesthood, okay? But our apostle, after you rightly divide, and you see that he's dealing with Israel here, Paul doesn't come on the scene until Acts 9, and then he writes Romans through Philemon, and not one of his writings ever says we are priests. I just think that's amazing if that's what we are. We're not. By the way, they're going to be a priest. Why? Because they're going to be the ministers of God to the world. Israel, Jerusalem will be the throne. And they will minister to the world. They are the head honchos in the kingdom. Israel is. Not the Gentile nations. Israel. And they're going to be a kingdom of priests. So they have the authority of Christ who is reigning and ruling. And uh, so I think that's just a good point. Three, and shall reign with him a thousand years. A thousand is the Greek word for M-I-L-L, -L, millennium. Okay, that's why we say the millennium, the thousand years. God's word is absolutely true, and every promise he has made to his people will be fulfilled. Matthew 6, and after this manner, therefore pray you, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, that they do at every football game, just about, used to, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. <laughs> now do we pray for the kingdom to come? We pray for the rapture to come. <laughs> Lord Jesus, deliver us from this present evil world. Amen. Zechariah, and the Lord shall be king over all the earth in that day. There shall be one Lord and his name one. 
his promise to Abraham. Uh, D, his promise to David. C, his promise to Israel's new covenant. Now, I think this is important. For the thousand years, the true believers and those believers of the past who have been resurrected together get to go into the kingdom. And the reason they're going to be successfully living for God and Christ is because the new covenant is enacted at that moment. And it's because of that new covenant they will have the power to live the law out in their life. Notice Jeremiah. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, the, 12, uh, the ten, the two. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. And then notice the last sentence there. For they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will what? Forgive their iniquity or sins and I will remember their sin for how long? Okay. You can turn your phone off. <laughs> can't. <laughs> we get our age things don't bother you like that. Our earplugs are going off and everything. Uh, Stan, you got Acts? Now, remember this, what he was saying here. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus Christ and so on. When does Israel get her sins totally removed? Right here, when Christ returns, they go in the kingdom under the new covenant. Your iniquity, your sins, I'll remember no more. That's when they get their sins forgiven. Okay? Okay, last page. Romans 11. And so all Israel shall be saved as it is written, all believers. <laughs> then shall come out of Sion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob or Israel. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. That happens right here. The Jew back here, in a sense, were saved on credit of Christ's work, but it's not fulfilled totally until right here, when they go in the kingdom. Amen. When the, and when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. So at the end of this thousand year reign here, Satan's going to be loosed for a brief period of time. Notice what I say there. Remember the kingdom, N-E-V-E-R, never ends, but transitions into the eternal kingdom. Here at the end of the thousand years, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Question, if the kingdom is to never end, why does he stick a thousand years in, them, in there? There is a reason for it. And next week I'll explain that reason, okay? He must be loosed a little season. Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. You would think that after, A-F-T-E-R, after a thousand years of Christ reigning, peace, pure righteousness, day of heaven on earth, that Satan could not get anyone to follow him. Wrong. <laughs> You'll see next week that there is the sand of the sea. That's how many will rise up. You know, it's like almost 
Some kids, they grow up in legalistic homes. You can't do this, you can't do that, and so on. It's always about mainly the negative rather than inside the heart. Legalism, it's rules, it's personal preferences, all these things in order to be saved, in order to God to hear your prayers, whatever. And I forgot my thought. Joe, what do you think? I think that's uh, good <laughs> Thank you, Joe. I don't even know what I was thinking, Tammy. Is the day Sunday? It's not, is it? Okay. <laughs> it was good. You have to trust me. Man's rebellion at the end. Let me read this sentence again. Maybe I'll remember it. <laughs> After a thousand years, Christ reigned, peace, pure, righteous, day of heaven on earth, that Satan could not get anyone to follow him. Wrong, and I don't even know what I was thinking. That's just where I am right now. Man's heart is evil. Oh, I know what it is now. Thank you. Thank you for helping me. <laughs> but, as she said at the end, under that mm, tightness on them, you know, it's a balancing act. I understand, but some parents are so rigid with their kids that as soon as they get to a certain age, they get a little liberty, they go bonkers. <laughs> they just go crazy. They want to experience sin all at one time. And that's the way it happens a lot of times. Well, in the millennium, a thousand years, these people can't act out what they really think inside. The ones that are born that have a sinful nature, seed of Adam in them, they have to decide, choose, is it going to be Christ who's there present or your own way? You're going to have to decide. And it's as the sand of the sea. There'll be so many, he says, I don't, the only reason I've been keeping these rules is because Christ will get on me, but it's not in my heart, okay? So that will take place then. And next week, we get to the, we get to the reason and the white throne judgment, and it's really good, okay?